Hi, I'm Kate Buckhart from the Lake Forest Library, and we're here with Marianne Cartwright from Green Minds Lake Forest Lake Bluff, and this is part two of Environmental Solutions for Weed and Pest Control. You can find part one on the Lake Forest Library YouTube channel, and after this is over, uh, you can find this there also, which you get to from our homepage, which is lakeforestlibrary.org. And if you have any questions after viewing this, you can email those to the library at reference at Lake Forest Library, and we will pass those along to Marion. And now we're going to turn it over to her. Thank you, Kate. It's nice to be able to do part two of less toxic and more environmentally safe ways to handle pests around your home and yard. Again, I am a representative speaking for Green Minds, like Forest Lake Bluff, a volunteer organization. I invite you to visit us at green-minds.org. And that's in the first slide, part one as well, more about that. But I wanna get us into where we left off from part one. And we were about ready to launch into rodenticide use and what's doing to our environment and safer alternatives to the second generation rodenticide. So I'm gonna share my screen. It'll just take me a brief moment to get back into the PowerPoint and we'll bring up the full PowerPoint. Here we go. Actually, I'm going to have to do that again. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Gonna to have to go all the way through. Oh, sorry. There we go. This is where we left off. Thank you for bearing with that while we got to the middle of the slideshow. So we're going to pick up on rodenticides, and I start here by saying I am always happy to see a red-tailed hawk in our backyard or at night to hear the call of a screech owl, or in this case, that's a great horned owl on the left. These red-tailed hawks and owls are wonderful mousers. They also get the voles in our yard. But these birds of prey, like the great horned and the red tail pictured here, are suffering neurological poisoning and even death from eating rodents that have been that have eaten a rodenticide that has an anticoagulant in it. And for an example, I've seen them out in the environment. While I was walking in McCormick Ravine a few years ago, I saw a neurologically compromised red-tailed hawk try to dive from a tree down to catch some prey and it failed and it just sat there pathetically on the ground. This head was shaking from side to side. And I know that is a sure sign of rodenticide poisoning. And I did go back and I found that same hawk dead in a close by spot two days later and I was heartbroken. Um, if a hawk consumes enough poisoned rodents, it, it will lead to hemorrhaging and death in that hawk. And I have taken in my car in a box poison hawks to a bird rehabilitator and watched as she injected vitamin K into the breast of the hawk to stop the hemorrhaging. And again, that is just heartbreaking to watch. So the EPA, we decided back in 2011, the Environmental Protection Agency decided back in 2011 that retail products that are marketed to us residential customers should no longer contain these really awful persistent second generation anticoagulants. Brodificum was the one that we all were using back in the day, but they were banned from retail in 2011. However, licensed pest control operators are still allowed to use them and they use a lot of them. And these things like Brodificum are, can still be purchased on the internet by anyone, rodenticide bait carrying Brodificum. So the sad fact is even though they're banned in the stores, they're still out there way too much in our environment. So what are our alternatives for managing things like voles and mice? First of all, I would just really encourage you that anything in your garage or your shed that a mouse would perceive as food is either hung in a mesh bag from the ceiling 
or is it a mouse proof, proof container? And the minute you see any mouse scat or you out should come a trap, a snap trap in that garage. And there are plenty of different kinds of easy to set traps on the market for less dexterous aging hands at this point. So voles will move into our shed, not so much mice, but voles move into our shed and they're seeking shelter from our local fox, I think. Not so much food as shelter. So they're gonna come in whether I put everything, hang everything or not, they're in there. So again, I set traps in our shed whenever I see scat. And I, the minute after I've set them, I will always check that trap several times that same day. And surely the first thing in the morning, I wear gloves and then I will reset that trap until I catch no more. And I'll do this throughout the year and it really helps me keep down the numbers. Um, also every year as one of my fall chores in, in late October when the temperature is dropping, I just proactively set out traps in the shed and the garage because that's when voles and mice are looking for shelter that'll help them get through winter and they're gonna move into places. So I will start by putting traps out in late October, just as one of my chores on the calendar, like you change your smoke detectors. Um, and I also buy um, this product here, uh, Mouse Magic on the left. These are mint scented pouches. They're just organic. They sell them at lots of places. And that pouch that smells quite nicely of mint is a real deterrent to mice. And I stick it in corners according to directions and I change them every month throughout the winter to help keep them from moving in. Um, but again, I'm just not one to, to rely just on a mint pouch. I also will go with snap traps and they are truly the most humane I, a way to catch a mouse I can think of. You can invest in a zapper for $50, which electrocutes them. I have not done that. I just use snap traps. If um, it can be that sometimes you just can't get on top of mice that are moving into a house. I have friends who live in wooded areas in old homes and they just can't keep on top of the mice. And I really understand that. Um, and so, you know, you may need to use a poison bait to get on top of the mice that are inside your house. And fortunately we have an alternative now that's safe for everyone else besides mice. This is called Mouse X. There's also Rat X and there's also now Vole X. And these are all made from ground corn with salt added in. And the mice and the voles and the rats are attracted to these baits as food. But turns out mice and rats and voles cannot digest corn and they die after pigging out on this bait. And that salt in it makes them thirsty and so they're more likely to go outside to, to die to find water. And this corn bait will not harm any other mammals or birds if they run across it and try to eat it because they can digest corn. And any, any predator that eats one of these prey is fine because there's not some anticoagulant second generation rodenticide in there, it's corn. And I have to say, rats can be the hardest. My son had a trap savvy rat that would not trap in his basement. He lives in Maine. And that rat was starting to chew his electric wire so he couldn't trap it. So he brought, he bought mouse rat X on my suggestion and it worked. He got rid of the rat. I will say, if you are gonna have to use these baits to poison rodents, you need to use them wisely. You don't leave them out forever. You, when you have a problem, you know you have a problem, you've seen signs, put out the bait. You can't trap them, put out the bait put it out for several weeks and then pick it up. You don't wanna leave it out perennially because baits attract more mice or voles or rodents and they will just keep on coming if you leave it down and you get into this vicious, vicious cycle thinking, well, I have mouse problem, I have to keep it out. It happens all the time. I've heard about this, so I don't leave out baits. I have, and please never let a pest control company leave one of those black plastic bait boxes around your home. They say they're safe because no dogs can get in there, only the mice. But we all know what happens when the mice eat that and leave and die and somebody eats them. But these pest control companies are putting out black, these black plastic bait boxes. I see them all the time around churches, around my friends' front porches. And they every time the pest control company comes to your house, they don't even check. They just throw more rodificum bait inside that box as part of their service to you. And so the bait's out all the time, no monitoring. And 
that's how we get into resistant in resistance to baits in mice. That's how we get into poisoning in our environment. And it's just a cycle we've got to break. There's just far too much rodenticide out in our neighborhoods in Lake Forest and Lake Bluff. And I've spoken a lot about that with the rehabilitator where I took poison birds. She said, yeah, I get a lot of birds from Lake Forest and Lake Bluff. And if you can put up a mouse, put up an owl nest in your yard. You don't have to do a great horned owl. You can always do a screech owl box um, if you want to get a little bit of natural control going. So that's, if you have any questions about that at the end, we can go to that in the Q&A. The next, I'm going to move us into home cleaning and personal care products and how we can think about our own health, our family's health, and the health of the watershed when the, we flush and wash these things in our sinks and toilets and washing machines. Very important home. It's a huge other subject. So we're going to spend a little time on personal care and home cleaning products. And I'm going to start out with a challenge, a cleaning challenge for all of you. Try for one month to just ditch everything you've used and just switch to good old baking soda and white vinegar for just everything. Just start figuring out how to use it. Go online. There are lots of recipes online to help you do this and see what you think. You may not like the white residue of baking soda, you just sponge it off. I mean, they're, I use it for everything and they're so safe for the environment and our water and myself. If you, during COVID or you have someone with a really bad flu and you have a large family, you can always do some disinfecting if you need to. I just use soap and water because it's a disinfectant, it kills all germs, but some people like to have a spray. You can always buy the seventh generation products. They're very safe usually for the environment and the water. This one is made with thyme oil and it kills, as you see, 99.99. In other words, it kills everything. They just have to say that. So there you go. There's my cleaning challenge. Some people say, Marion, I hate the smell of vinegar. And if you object to that, then I would see, uh, one friend of mine will put lemon peels or any orange peels, citrus peels in a jar and soak, um, put the vinegar in there and soak it for a day or two. And then the vinegar smells more like citrus that she uses. Another good friend of mine uh, who lived in um, Australia orders this by gum, <laughs> by gum eucalyptus. It's a wonderful multi-purpose cleaner. It smells wonderful. And you, she puts in a spray bottle with some water and uses that. And then for a lot of cleaning um, of countertops and, and um, all kinds of stuff. And that's also in the resources pages that the library is emailing to all participants how to get this and other products like this. So there's my cleaning challenge to you. Um, and I think you'll be pleased with the results. I'd like to turn now to these, what's called everywhere chemicals that to try and bring you some awareness, just like we did with the pest, with the, um, chemicals for lawn care, I mean, for insects. Let's talk about chemicals that are in our cleaning and personal care products. And we're gonna go through these. These, are, these have been put out since the 50, 1950s and they're now everywhere. Um, and they're found in so many different products in our homes and they're where they stay and persist. I'm gonna start with parabens and these are preservatives and cosmetics and, and they're put in moisturizers, deodorant, shampoo, conditioners, toothpaste. They act like estrogen in the body and they are endocrine disruptors. And if you look on a label, you might see methylparaben or ethylparaben or butylparaben. There are several of them. And once you start looking at labels, you'll see a lot of them. We are slathering these all over our bodies and they're getting into our skin and into our system. And they're now in, in utero and in milk and lactating mothers. It's just, they're everywhere. Phthalates, the next one phthalates are even more ubiquitous than parabens. They are also endocrine disruptors. Male and females are infected by them. Uh, they too are being found everywhere. This is a large diverse class of chemicals that's used to maintain the scent of fragrances. It's to keep plastic soft like a vinyl shower curtain. It's even used in harder plastics like TV and electronic casing, some of the other phthalates. Um, it's used in medical products. It's in food and beverage containers. It's in cosmetics. It's in cleaning products. We really need to understand how to get this out of our homes and you look for it on labels. Oxybenzone, a sunscreen agent. You don't wanna buy sunscreen with oxybenzone. 
anything what says just fragrances on a label is often not a botanical naturally based fragrance that usually breaks down safely in our bodies. There's synthetic fragrances that contain a whole mix of chemicals that many are, well, some are endocrine disruptors and manufacturers do not have to disclose fragrance ingredients. They're considered proprietary and there's a whole toxic mix and fragrances and perfumes, avoid them if you can. Sodium lorth sulfate, and there's also sodium laurel sulfate. These are foaming agents to use in dish soaps and shampoos and facial cleansers, toothpaste. That is an endocrine disruptor. And then there's DEA and there's several kinds, there's cocamide and loramide DEA. Again, these are moisturizers, sunscreens, soaps, and shampoos. So you can see these are everywhere. We have one, our, one of our sons is a physician's assistant and his uh, specialty is in endocrinology. So he works in an office and knows a lot about endocrine disruptors. And we talk about this a lot and he really steers clear of products like these as I do in my own home. I think palm olive finally got the message. Uh, we had been using the good old green palm olive for years. And if you look at the, la the label, you go, oh man, they just recently, just recently came out with, a, they got the message, no fragrance, zero parabens, zero phosphates and formulated without phthalates. So pretty, we're starting to get through consumer demand, better alternatives um, and also, a lot of talk about the BPA linings, you'll see BPA free in cans. The problem is they went with a substitute, they put in BPS, which is just as bad as BPA. So now we're supposed to look for cans that have no BPA or BPS, because those or phthalates in the linings. So canned goods, many of them still carry either BPA or BPS and phthalates. Um, Eden has long been one of the on only companies that doesn't. Uh, a lot of people just try not to buy food in cans, which is a sad thing. I think it's a good way to distribute food to our country, but they're not safe, those linings, or people say buy it in glass or try to find cans that say BPA, BPS and phthalate free, good luck, but there are a few. And with the palm olive, I've gone one step further just to get rid of the plastic itself that's containing the dish soap because plastic, the manufacturer of plastic comes with all kinds of chemicals in our environment that are environmentally toxic. So I just you can go one step further and order from a Chicago based company called Meliora, you can get a solid bar of dish soap that does just what palm olive does is but it's a bar and it comes in a cardboard box. I really am enjoying this new company. It was started by a couple, they're engineers. They said they live in Chicago and they said, can we do better to get the job done in our house but not hurt the environment? Let's make a product line. And they have, and you can order them online. They're not on retail share stores yet, but I'm really enjoying trying all of their products and they work really well. All the ingredients are clearly listed and fully disclosed as you can see here. And I love the name. In Latin, it means better, melior. It's a great company and their products, I feel really good about them in my home. Also, a lot of people have used air fresheners for years, um, bathrooms elsewhere. They carry a lot of fragrances that are not good for us, as we've mentioned. I have switched, these are found a lot of hardware stores. The Maso natural bag, Maso is a type of bamboo. And this is just, bamboo in there that's been it's been burned to charcoal and it absorbs odors and moisture and we have a kind of a moisty basement because we don't use the air conditioner much in the summer so it gets cool and dank down there and this keeps our basement feeling smelling pretty fresh um, all year round and it helps absorb the moisture and when I it has a timeline on it for about two years and afterwards you just cut open that linen bag and you put the bamboo charcoal out in the garden. And this is a bamboo that it's not, don't worry, it's not in the endangered giant pandas diet. <laughs> they eat a different kind of bamboo. Most of bamboo is one of many kinds of bamboos. It's a large family in the grass family. So I really like these bags a lot. You can see fragrancy, chemical free. You can get a lot of good information to help you make these changes from the environmental working group. And there it is the website. 
on that website, you can find uh, a guide to cosmetics called the Skin Deep Guide. There's a guide to sunscreens, a guide to healthy cleaning products. There's a healthy living app, which is a searchable database with over 2,500 cleaning products. You can type in the name of something on the shelf you're looking at buying and say, do I want this? It's, and have it on your phone with you. They have a guide to food additives to look out for because there are a lot of confusing names there. Um, and they have a guide to where what uh, produce is most likely to have a dangerous pesticides and which are least likely. So it's a good website. You have to learn to navigate it. And there are quite a few pop-ups um, and they send you all kinds of stuff that they ask you, but it's a good database. And I really recommend you visit that website. And it's also in the resources that were sent to you. For example, this is where I was able to find a sunscreen that I now use myself. Our, our, one of our sons has skin allergies and is allergic to most sun products, skin, uh, sunscreen products on the market. He has to be very careful. And this is one you can see the uh, ingredients that they're, there they are all listed. They're all herbal um, and oils, seed oils. It uh, works great. It's reef safe, as you see there. Um, and it is safe for my face and it's safe for children, babies, which is really important. So I feel safe with Badger. Um, and I got it online because I have a hard time finding it in stores. One of the most visited pages, this is a screenshot actually, one of the most visited pages on our Green Minds website. And it is, we put together a directory to organic farms and garden markets that are within a 25 mile radius of Lake Forest and Lake Bluff. We also have um, the websites and links to farms that provide a home delivery of organic, sustainably raised grains and eggs and meats and fish. And I wanted to just give a shout out to what's right there smack dab in the middle, but our own local Elowa farm, where you can get the local food, the most local you'll get right here in our own city of Lake Forest and Lake Bluff, of course, too, is right down the pike. And I spent many years in that garden and growing a lot of safe vegetables right there for the neighborhood. So I encourage you to look on the Green Minds website to learn more about where you can get food that's safe without um, a lot of the pesticides that have hurt both the soil and our bodies. Um, I also would like to ask that if you feel the need to seal your driveway, and I have to tell you, it doesn't necessarily add to the lifetime of your driveway. That's kind of a, this overplayed aspect because they want you to seal. It's mostly for uh, aesthetics that people do it and they like it dark. And that's why they use coal tar based sealants because it makes it nice and black. I don't know what it is about that aesthetic that seems to be so important to people because the coal tar based pavement sealers are extremely environmentally toxic. They have polycitric aromatic hydrocarbons in them which get into our streams, into your house and they need to be we need to stop using them. And fortunately, Lowe's and the Home Depot have now removed coal tar based seal coat from their shelves for do it yourselfers. They've seen the light. We've got to stop. And I, if you really, if you hire a company, you have to ask them, are you using coal tar? And tell them, I don't want that. I would like a asphalt based sealant, please. For a really good rundown of information about this, I suggest you go to the Deerfield, Village of Deerfield website. They've done a great job, a lot of good information on the Village of Deerfield website. They've even made sure that any licensed uh, driveway ceiling company or, or parking lot ceiling company in their town has to, to get their license, they have to aff affirm they do not use coal tar. So that was their way of getting at, um, how to kind of regulate that I thought was a good way. So that's a real plea. Um, there were still too many parking lots and driveways in Lake Forest and Lake Bluff that are using coal tar. It's just time to get rid of it. We have a perfectly good alternative, which is asphalt based. However, that said, there are still PAHs, polycitric aromatic hydrocarbons in the asphalt base, just six times less. And I just threw this in at the end, since I now have time with part two. I think people are concerned about slugs in their garden and there's a lot of slug baits out there. I encourage you, if you do want to have vegetables or pretty flowers and you do have a problem with slugs because you're trying to use mulch, um, then this is a product that's safe because it's uh, basically 
just with iron is what kills the slugs. Um, it's a bait that they eat. Um, and it's, you can use it right up until harvest and it breaks down into a fertilizer and it'll last for two weeks with one application. It's just iron phosphate. Um, you also could do the good old jar, uh, glass jar lids filled with beer to trap them <laughs> and lay out some boards in the daytime for them to sequester under in the heat of the day and you can just pick them off there. But I think they are real for those of us who try to grow vegetables. And I will put in one thing as an ecologist and knowing, I know when to get them. I try to do homework on my pest as always as part of my IPM. I know that in the fall, they're gonna be laying their eggs. They're gonna overwinter into the, for the next season's growth. That's how they make it through the winter by and large is as an egg. Most of them die as adults. So I go ahead and in the late fall nights, usually around the World Series on baseball TV, during in between innings, you hop out there with a flashlight and look for slugs mating in your yard and get them out of there. So you you can stop the cycle, the breeding cycle, and get those. Make sure you have fewer eggs to start with in the spring. It's very effective. I when I moved into this house five years ago, we were overrun, and now I hardly see any, which is always nice to know. So Kate, you can. I'm going to stop there, and if we want to think about some questions, we're that's it for now. Okay, I had to unmute myself. Um, one question that I have is tell me more about the owl boxes. So you talk okay. about having a screech owl box or we have great horned owls in our yard. Um, we are always notified of their presence by the screaming crows. Yes. Um, but we love having them and interested in the boxes. Good question. Okay, let's do, there's a, there's a great horned owl nest that you can create, and there are also screech owl boxes, um, depending on what kind of trees you have. Great horned owls will nest pretty high up. They don't have to be that high, uh, maybe 40 feet up, but I've hired a tree care, a tree company to climb a tree and put one way up in a crotch of a larger tree for a great horned owl. You can, great horned owls do not build their own nest. They take over a used old nest, usually a hawk nest, sometimes a squirrel nest. Um, and they start nesting and well, they start calling for their mates in January to reestablish pair bonds. And the female is on her eggs in the nest, laying on her eggs by Valentine's Day in the snow. On top of those eggs, her body's large enough to keep them warm. She's fed by her mate and stays on that nest. And so those babies are hatched out in March when it's still cold, but they have to do that because by the time the babies are called what's branchers and they're out of the nest, they're hungry, they need a lot of prey. So they need that April flush of babies for rabbit babies, mouse babies to feed their ever growing young owlets. So that's why they're on the nest so early. So we, I, if you wanna have a great horned owl, it's very easy to, you can put up a nest and they'll come. They are opportunistic. They're always looking for nests and you can always encourage another one. They have a large territory. So if you've already got one nest, you may not want a second one too close. They're, they're gonna clash. They need a pretty big territory for a nesting pair. But we in Lake Forest Open Lands, I put one up with my camp kids. We gave them as presents to people. A lot of people learned about that and got excited. And um, it's not, I bought a huge big basket from a nursery, lighters nursery, um, you know, the metal frame and I lined it first with a little landscape floth, and then I put down some sticks and um, more sticks than smaller branches. And I put in some white pine boughs. And then the most important thing around the edge of the basket, I wove in and out, in and out, in and under some grapevine because the owl or the little babies, the owlets, when they become branchers and want to leave the nest, they need something to hold on to. And they need that to help them get out of the nest. You can't, you've got to give them a rim to grab onto so they safely and they don't drop to the ground. <laughs> you want to give them a safe nest. It was, you know, they came that first year. So we put it up in uh, early December to give the parents time to find it. And we had it that first year we had them. So that's a great horn owl nest. And there are plans online um, that you can look into for that. A screech owl is a cavity nester. And most of us don't have dead snags with cavities anymore. In our, and there too few cavities for all birds like chickadees and bluebirds, but screech owls. And screech owls are really good mousers and bowlers. And they're small, so they're a little easier. They smaller habitat, smaller range. So you can buy a screech owl box and put it up. or 
uh, those of you who have a wood shop or have a friend, you can build your own. The plans are online. Um, and those will be successfully moved in as well. In the Eastern Screech Owl, there's a gray or a rusty brown phase. They're both our Eastern Screech Owl. They just have two color phases. And they have a wonderful, funny, descending whinny call that you'll hear at night. We had one in our yard and our little boys when they were young used to love to go out, mommy, it's calling. And we'd all go out to listen. So I highly encourage Screech Owl nesting. We, we have one, we have had one in the past and uh, wow, once you hear it, you absolutely know what it is. Yeah, um, I mean it. <laughs> and one other question was about packaging. So um, buying products in glass or plastic and um, you have, I know you can buy a lot of these online and perhaps Whole Foods. Are there other places that you shop? That's a great question because you know, some, for example, like Burt's Bees is, is one of those kind of product lines that's going to have less of those synthetics and the parabens and the oxybenzones and more than the botanically based. But here it is in a plastic tube and the plastic has phthalates in it to make it soft and pliable. So my, is that any good? And what you hear, what you read about is that the plastics in the product are the worst. The plastics in the plastic are so minimal compared to what people were getting in their older products. But you can look for glass and you can look for, co for cosmetics that you're gonna be putting frequently on your skin that come in glass. And you just have to look for the packaging when you're shopping online. And this I found at Walgreens, it's a Burt's Bees that comes in glass. And it, so here's a Burt's Bees hand, here's a Burt's Bees both for hand. And I ended up you know, moving to glass because I feel better with glass. Um, so. I think the most important thing though is more than, than container it comes in is the what's in the product that you're slathering on your skin. But for our environment in general, the least the less plastic, the better. And packaging comes from us. We have to start saying, I don't want it. It's gonna cost more in glass, fine. Uh, glass is heavier to transport, so it costs more in shipping. There goes our energy costs up, but if we get to electric cars, those all of that life cycle is a tough call. A lot of people start to make their own cleaning products and that, and um, excuse me, and, and lotions. You can make your own. It, it, I don't want you guys to get stuck going down a rabbit hole. You, you gotta live your life. You can't just be freaked out by everything, <laughs> but you can begin a journey of becoming more sane because it's gotten a little insane. And I found there's a new book, it's in the um, resources that I sent out. It just came out um, this year. And I just yesterday was actually on a Zoom call with the author, the two authors and another researcher from Italy discussing everything in this book. And it was perfect timing because I knew I'd be doing this with Kate today. Um, and this book, Countdown, um, you can get in paperback too, I think, has a lot of information about these everywhere chemicals and how to avoid them in your house. It's, they did a really nice job. So I, if you really are worried about it, um, it's a quick read and I think it'll just calm down the temperature and get you not too worried and you, you don't have to go crazy. It's not that hard now because consumers are asking for it. And the more we buy these products, the faster we get rid of all the other stuff because it's not going to happen with regulation. Europe regulates, US, we're not regulating. It's just a different business climate here. So it's going to be consumer demand and that businesses will respond. Great. Well, we will make sure that the Lake Forest Library has that book. Um, we'll oh, good. Talk. Thank you. We'll make sure that we have some copies if anybody wants to put it on hold. You can always call the reference desk. And I think that we're so thankful to have Marion Kurt right here today with Green Minds to uh, help us on our journey. <laughs> you know, Kate, one thing I should throw in there and then we'll get off. It is spring and we're all starting to plant our gardens. And if you are growing vegetables, take a look at your garden hoses. I, you know, they, all the older ones are made with some pretty bad vinyls and uh, they have a lot of phthalates. You can now go to most garden supply stores and look for drinking water safe grade hoses. And right to the, the um, all the brass fittings, all of that, you, you don't want, a lot of them had lead um, and, so, and a lot of them were PVC. So you, I would really recommend you take a look if you're watering your vegetable, we haven't had any water all spring, what you're using to deliver the water counts. So that's another, either a marine grade hose, because that's used in boats, or a drinking water safe 
hose, not that you have to drink out of it, but your vegetables and what you're eating. So that's one last thing at spring. <laughs> Great. Good tip. Okay. All right. Thanks, so, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Kate. All right. Uh, bye -bye. Visit lakeforestlibrary.org and click on the YouTube and you'll find this recording. Well, I guess you're already there. Yeah, you're here. <laughs> you did it. All right. Thanks, Miriam. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.